All righty, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, of course, we are studying 2 Corinthians, and uh, I got kind of stuck in chapter 5, verse 10, where the Apostle Paul uh, refers to, of course, the judgment seat of Christ. So we've been spending a few weeks examining the issue of the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, we ended up here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because the Apostle Paul, although he does not uh, use the language, the judgment seat of Christ, we know as we study the passage that it is referring to the judgment seat of Christ. There is going to be a day where there will be a fire evaluation, a, a fire test, if you will. And uh, uh, involved is the sort of material that a believer builds into their lives. So uh, with that said, I'll read the passage and we're going to jump right into it. I don't want to provide any more review. Uh, we've said some things thus far. Uh, but anyway, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if we uh, begin at verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We uh, noted that the Apostle Paul does not specifically tell us what is the gold, silver, precious stone, nor does he specifically tell us what is the wood, hay, and stubble. So we don't have to resort to, you know, fanciful speculation or uh, all sorts of ideas. And by the way, you, you know, there are a lot of different ideas regarding what exactly is the gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, it's always uh, obviously safe to allow the verses of Scripture to give us an idea of what might be involved, okay? And uh, what we did a few weeks ago is we started by uh, examining passages of Scripture that make a reference to gold, silver, and precious stone. And we noted that there is in theology something that is called the law of first mention. Please, that is not a hard, fast rule. Exercise the so-called law of first mention or the law of first occurrence. Uh, exercise tremendous caution because it isn't always uh, going to work out, okay? So anyway, it is interesting that the first occurrence when we examine the, the history, the chronology of Scripture, the book of Job, uh, the oldest book that was written, well, the book of Job, uh, when we understand that it is first in chronology, we can learn about gold, silver, and precious stone. Chapter 28 likens the, uh, the pursuit of wisdom, the pursuit of of knowledge, the pursuit of divine understanding. It is likened to someone who is engaged in subterranean mining. And if men are willing to risk life and limb to find a nugget of gold or a piece of precious rock, what Job chapter 28 is saying, well, uh, to what lengths will man go to extract the gold, silver, and precious stone of wisdom and understanding and heavenly knowledge. So interesting, already the scriptures provide a, a uh, foundation when we begin examining gold, silver, precious stone. The first occurrence in the canon of scripture, okay? There's a difference between the canon of Scripture and the chronology. Well, in the canon of Scripture, obviously the book of Genesis is the first book. And there in Genesis chapter 24, we learn of the first
first occurrence in the Bible referring to gold, silver, and precious stone. You read it, and I won't comment anymore. Then we find in First Chronicles chapters 28 and 29, the first occurrence of the building of the temple utilizing gold, silver, and precious stones. And when we examine and sort of uh, paint this portrait, uh, we get a feel for how God views gold, silver, and precious stone in light of his wisdom, in light of the the earnest of an inheritance, a taste of the riches that are available to uh, Rebecca, who's going to be marrying uh, Isaac. And then, of course, the material that is used in the building of the temple, the house of God, the place where God desires to dwell in, and the use of that uh, material, the uh, the valuable material, the material that will endure and last, and so on and so forth. And by the way, we can appreciate all the parallels. Listen, in the dispensation of the grace of God, we are privileged to possess the advanced realm, the advanced level of knowledge, the advanced levels of spiritual revelation and spiritual comprehension. So, uh, and by the way, Paul, he talks about how the mystery, the hidden wisdom of God is, is a treasure. It's the riches of wisdom. And so we can appreciate those parallels. We also know some things about the vast wealth that we have and enjoy in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We today, by studying the advanced revelation of the mystery, we get to taste some of the uh, inheritance. We get a foretaste of some of the riches that are going to be lavished upon us in eternity. And we get to learn about it today. And then, of course, course, we know God has built another temple, not a temple made with hands, brick and mortar. But you and I, first Corinthians chapter three, since we're here, drop down to verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the what? The temple of God. Isn't that fascinating? The first time we read about a temple, 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and 29, we find the material that is being used is gold, silver, and precious stone. So God today, he's building a temple. Paul, in the context, he's he's, uh, uh, exhorting the believers, take heed how you build. Are we using the material that God has provided for the building of his temple, his dwelling place today in the dispensation of the grace of God? Are we taking the gold, silver, precious stones, the advanced measure of of wisdom and knowledge that God so delights in making known? And we get to enjoy those riches, okay? So with all of that said, what about the wood, hay, and stubble? Again, if we appreciate the law of first occurrence. And we're going to go to the book of Exodus here in just a second. Well, we we can learn how the scriptures utilizes the terms wood, hay, and stubble. By the way, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is the only is the first time in the New Testament and the only time in the New Testament that we learn about these six specific types of building material. So, you know, there is some merit to the law of first mention, but it's not a hard and fast rule, okay? So with that said, wood, hay, and stubble, specifically in light of the Exodus narrative or the Exodus motif. That sounds real fancy, right? There is a striking similarity There is a striking parallel to what we read about in the book of Exodus and the usage of specifically hay, stubble, and straw in light of what is happening to the nation of Israel. There is this parallel to the book of Galatians. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to spend a little bit, we're going to spend probably the whole time just identifying these different parallels uh, between 
Exodus and the book of Galatians. I counted seven of them, and, and I know there are more. In fact, there are more. If we were to expand to the rest of Paul's epistles, you'll discover tremendous parallel and similarity to what's going on in the book of Exodus. So for this morning, in fact, I titled the lesson, Wood, Hay, Stubble, the Exodus Motif. By the way, motif simply means that there is a recurring theme. There is a repetition in theme. There's a pattern. There are similar concepts. There are similar ideas, okay? And I trust we'll see that we're not making this up. Paul in Galatians is going to use identical language that we're going to read about in the book of Exodus. Now, it's not, I mean, there's going to be, in one instance, similar language, but Paul utilizes identical language. Uh, for example, then I'll just rattle it off. Tell you what, while I'm rattling on, turn to Exodus chapter 1, all right? Let's go to the book of Exodus, okay? Uh, in the book of Galatians, as well as in the book of Exodus, we, we read about a building or something that is to be built. We, of course, between Exodus and Galatians, we'll read about bondage. We'll read about taskmasters. We're going to read about works. We're going to read about redemption. We're going to read about liberty. We're going to read about deliverance. We're going to read about sonship. All of that is in the book of Exodus before the law. The book of Galatians is going to press upon the Galatians by use of language that, that we can kind of, well, I hope when we go back to the book of Exodus, we can, we can just discover, I hope, a rich treasure of, of, of just precious truths regarding what it is God is doing today, all right? So when we go back to the book of Exodus, we were here last time. I just want to pick up and, and, and develop it just a little bit more. You remember what's going on in Exodus chapter 1. Uh, notice there verse 27. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. You recall we noted last Sunday morning what we have is a new uh, commission, a, a new Adam and Eve commission. Remember what God told Adam, uh, he, 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 the, the, the same length, be fruitful and multiply. And, and we read uh, now in Genesis, replenish the earth. Here we find that Israel is now fulfilling the commission that God initially, originally intended. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, we keep reading. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And, of course, Isaiah chapter 52, this guy's an Assyrian Clearly, there is a demonic, satanic element connected to what's going on here. And, and, and I said I wasn't going to review anything, but okay, you have Adam and Eve. And what happens? Satan appears in Genesis chapter 3. He's going to oppose God's original intention to have his creature, the new creature at that time, to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. So what does Satan do? He, of course, tempts Eve, and you know the rest of the story. And then uh, as a result, uh, Cain kills Abel, and then Cain has a son, Enoch. And what does Enoch do? He builds a city, a city in direct defiance. When God said, spread out, what does Satan do? No, we're going to have a strength. We're, we're, we're going to have uh, we're going to have a central point of rebellion, a city. Then, of course, we move on in history, and uh, you recall what happens. Noah, he then receives a recommission. What does God say to Noah and his sons? You go out there, be fruitful, you multiply, and you spread across the land. And uh, Noah and his wife, they're the new Adam and Eve. But remember, what did Satan do after Genesis chapter 9? We get to Genesis chapter 10, and we learn about a new city, a new kingdom, Babel. And then, of course, we read in Genesis chapter 11, this tower that's we be, that was being built. And then God stepped... 
Here's my point. Satan in defiance. He builds institutions and monuments of rebellion and defiance by building a city. The city is for the purpose of preventing God's people from being fruitful, from multiplying, and from replenishing and spreading out all over the land. So when we read the language, we can't help but notice there's going to be a new Babel taking place in the land of Egypt. Now remember, Adam and Eve, they fell. Then we find Genesis chapter 6, God destroys all of humanity. Then uh, as we continue reading what's going on in Genesis, you have Babel being built, God comes down, and they left off building the city. Now, Read there at verse 9. And he, that new king, the Assyrian, said unto the people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. See that? So uh, keep reading. And it come, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore did they uh, set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. There's a new Babel going on here. The commission. See, God now, he's the one fulfilling the commission, right? Through Israel, my seed, you know, Abraham and his seed and, and all of that. So uh, what does Satan now do through Pharaoh? They're going to build cities. And by the way, these treasure cities had a military component, an economic component, and a religious component to it, just like Babel, by the way. There's a military component. He was a hunter. There was a uh, economic component and there was a religious component, a tower whose top may reach on to heaven. So when we just read the language, we, we begin to see uh, not only the, the satanic uh, tactic to defy what God is doing, but in, in the context, cities that are being built to prevent Israel from fulfilling what God is uh, seeking to do, so on and so forth. So uh, anyway, in verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. Drop down to verse 14. And they made, well, let's read verse 13, And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter, with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Here you have God's people now, enslaved, oppressed, in sore bondage. It's called the iron furnace. And, and, and with, with, with rigor, hardship. I mean, it's, it's dark. It's depressing. It's, it's discouraging. And as we continue on in the narrative, go to Exodus chapter 5. Go to Exodus chapter 5. Um, you, you, you understand, you remember some of the deep, um, I'm going to assume you understand what's going on historically. Exodus chapter 5 and then uh, verse uh, 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go. Verse 2, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Verse 4, And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works? Here you have Moses, who's warning Pharaoh, you, you better let God's people go. And, and so Pharaoh says, wait a minute, we're, we're, who are you guys? And, and why is it that you're trying to relieve? Verse, verse 5, and Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye make them rest from their burdens. So you have this cruel, hard rigor. 
And, uh, and the, the warning, you better let him go. And so Pharaoh, said, Pharaoh he, he orders and commands the taskmasters to intensify the brutality, to intensify the rigor and the hardship. Wait a minute. You, Moses, are, are, are trying to uh, give Israel a reprieve, relief, rest from the burden. So just, just let that roll around a little bit. Verse 7, Ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. They're building cities of rebellion. They're building religious, military, economic monuments in defiance to God in defiance to his people. And we find for the first time the use of this building material called straw. So you, you, at the outset now when we, again, Paul doesn't tell us what the wood hand stubble is. But scripture provides us a glimpse of the use of that material in correlation with a building and this building is satanic. It is for the purpose of oppressing God's people. It's for the purpose of brutalizing God's people. It's for the purpose of, of uh, preventing God's people from enjoying rest, liberty, Freedom. Drop down to verse 12. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather. Here we go. Stubble instead of straw. Is it getting better? It's getting worse. So, so that's the language Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let every man take heed. How are we going to build? Are we going to use the highest level of spiritual revelation, the highest uh, uh, levels of spiritual wisdom and understanding, the gold, silver, and precious stones? Are we building into our inner man as we're part of this glorious temple, this house of God? Or are we building the wood, hay, and stubble that Scripture uh, uses as a figure, as a type of material in connection to a satanic structure that is being erected for the sole purpose of destroying God's people and preventing God from accomplishing what it is he has set out to do, to multiply and spread and fill the land. Now, I just, I'm going to leap. Satan today, he's interested in destroying God's temple, God's house. Satan isn't interested in allowing God via and by default you and me as his people to be participants in the building of God's house, God's temple. So if he can get any one of us to utilize the inferior material wood, hay, and stubble, which by nature, in figure and in type, is satanic material, lest we fill the land. Now think about where we're destined for all of eternity. They're called what? Heavenly places. Now Satan can't stop. But we're going to see some things that Paul writes there in the book of Colossians especially. Wait a minute. Can Satan do something to the believer now that can have eternal ramifications in the heavenly places? You think about the motif. The recurring idea. God seeking to do something in the land. Well, we now know God is seeking to do something where in the heavenly places. 
And just as Satan stands in direct opposition and defiance against what God is doing with Israel in the land, you better understand Satan's doing it right now today in defiance to what God plans to do in accordance to his eternal purpose in the heavenly places. The wood, hay, and stubble is material that Satan seeks the believer today to build into the realm of their inner man because it has an impact in the temple at large, in the structure at large. So I, I, I kind of, like I said, now drop down to verse 13, verse 13, and the taskmasters hasted them, saying, fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was what? Strong. Boy, this is, it's kind of ugly. You know what God says through Moses? My God says, let my people go. I want my people to go out there in the wilderness. I want them to have a feast. I want them to go out there and I want them to sacrifice. I want them to go out there and I want them to serve. I want them to enjoy the liberty and the reprieve from the hard oppression. I want them to have rest. And what does Satan say? You're not going to rest. By the way, should we not rest in Christ? And what does the satanic policy of evil try to motivate us to do? Hey, build a little bit of that straw, a little bit of that stubble, and, and fulfill your works. Fulfill the works of the taskmasters. Boy, there's fascinating typology. The works of the flesh. So just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, go to chapter 6, Exodus chapter 6. And notice there verse 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep where? In bondage. Okay, now notice verse 6. Wherefore? <laughs> um, verse 6. Uh, Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you out of, with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. So uh, let's, let's just let's make the, the connections here. Let's make some of the parallels here. Let's just enjoy. Now, go to Galatians chapter 2. So keep, keep, some, keep a marker in Exodus, and then we're going to go to Galatians. Now, if we go back to uh, Exodus chapter 1 and go to Galatians chapter 2, uh, you, I trust you understand what Paul is doing uh, in the book of Galatians. The Galatians, sadly, they're reverting back to uh, a system of, uh, of uh, you know, performance management, okay? The Galatians were delivered from idols. Interesting the way Paul describes it. If you notice there in Galatians uh, chapter uh, 4, just notice first in Galatians chapter 4, and then we go to chapter 2. Notice in Galatians chapter 4, just so we have a feel for what's going on at Galatia. Galatians 4 verse 9. But now, after that, you have known God, or rather, are known of God. Uh, I'm sorry, read verse 8. Verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no God. So these Galatians, they were your typical run-of-the-mill pagan idolaters, and they were, of course, serving the false gods, Right? So uh, they're, they're saved out of paganism. They're saved out of idol worship. But now they're being victimized, we'll see that, by taskmasters. And what are they doing? Verse 9, but now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and, and can't help but notice this, beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be what? In bondage, gold, silver, precious stones, the riches, the wealth, the treasure, the, uh, uh, the, the, the great uh, preciousness of, of all that we have in Christ. What do the Corinthians do? They're resorting back to the beggarly and obviously the wood hay stubble doesn't represent the wealth. It represents the beggarly elements 
And then verse 9 ends, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. The Galatians went from paganism to Christ, and now they're being led to turn from Christ, not back to paganism, but, but to what? The law. And Paul, it's kind of a distinction without a difference. To go back to, to, go to the law is no different than going back to paganism. And you think, what I just said is heresy. No, it's not. If God shut down the law program and we're not under the law, Paul says, but we're under grace. For a believer today to place themselves under that flesh-based performance management system is likened onto paganism. I mean, it sounds harsh, but that's exactly the problem that Paul's addressing. But uh, go to chapter 2 and uh, at, at the outset. So we already read in Exodus chapter 1, uh, there at verse 11. In, in Exodus 1 verse 11, Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasures their building. And in the building project, they are reduced in abject humiliation and rigor, you're going to have to use stubble to make the brick, to build the cities. Notice Paul in Galatians chapter 2, and we read there at verse 18, For if I, what, build again, the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Uh, you know, and, and we're not going to dig. What, what's Paul talking about? What is it that Paul destroyed? And if Paul now, he rebuilds the things that he destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Real rough Simple illustration. Can you imagine after 60 million people were killed during World War II? The Allied effort successfully, I might add, destroyed the Nazis. Can you imagine after Hitler blew his brains out and, and, and Germany surrendered and World, II, World War II ends? What if the Allies said, well, tell you what, Nazis, we'll give you a second chance. Would, would, would the Allies have allowed the Nazis to rebuild? Can I tell you this? They took effort to make sure that philosophical, that ugly, that system would never raise its ugly head again. Okay? So that's a rough illustration. It, it, it would defy, I mean, if, if the Allies would have allowed the Nazis to rebuild their political party. Well, Paul says, if I build again the things which I destroyed in the context, what is Paul dealing with? He's dealing with the law and the Galatian problem, the, the victimization of the Galatians forcing them to return to a dispensational program that God says he suspended. Paul, by the way, is the one whom God used to communicate to the church, listen, the law has been destroyed, dispensationally speaking. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. And just notice uh, the language that Paul uses, Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 14, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the what? Law. You know what that middle wall of partition was between Jew and Gentile? It's called the law. And so what is God proclaiming and declaring in this current dispensation of grace. You know what God did to that wall? He tore it down. 
What did Reagan say back in eight? I forgot when it was. I'm too young. I'm not. No. What did Reagan say to Gorbachev? He said, tear down this wall. Now imagine after it was torn down, uh, again, uh, would, would we have commissioned somebody else to rebuild the wall? You understand what's going on here. Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, was called upon to reveal to all of humanity the dis, this radical dispensational change, that one-time wall, 1,500 years, an impenetrable wall. Why did he build the wall? To keep the Gentiles out, by the way. To maintain the distinct, unique place that Israel had. God says, you're my people. You're not going to be numbered with those Gentiles. So God established a wall in grace Paul is the one to whom God declares, I busted that wall down. Would Paul have been a transgressor if he rebuilt the law? You see what the, the image here? What Paul is saying to Peter in, Genesis, in, in Galatians chapter 2 is, Peter, you know the grace that was given unto me. You know that God eradicated the wall of separation called the law. It's broken down. It's gone. It's busted. It's destroyed. Peter, why are you living as though there is still a wall between Jew and Gentile? That's why Paul says, and he got him. By the way, Paul is, Paul is not being mean and nasty to Peter. Now, he stood, withstood him to his face. But isn't it interesting? Paul says, if I build again, the things which I destroyed. Peter, you're the one rebuilding the wall. I took it down. Go over to, uh, to for sake of time, uh, go over to Philippians. Go over to Philippians. And, and again, so the law is destroyed. So when we read about a building project in the book of Exodus, utilizing straw and stubble, the, the inferior material, representing the, the rigor, the hardship, the bondage, the satanic defiance, the satanic rebellion, the satanic uh, opposition. Can a believer use that same material? You know, if a believer goes back to the law program, you're using the wood, hay, stubble material. Philippians chapter 3, notice there, and, well, look there at verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you, to me in, indeed is not grievous, but to you, for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the circumcision. Uh, concision, I'm sorry. And just for sake of time, we're going to look at the taskmasters, okay? When Paul refers to believers that are reverting back to the law, he he will acknowledge there is an element actively engaged in bringing God's people under the shackles of bondage. So just so notice, beware dogs, evil workers. By the way, if Paul calls them dogs, good guys or bad guys. By the way, I'm driving down Roselle, and anyway, I make a left turn on Hillcrest, and I thought, man, it's a, look at that dog. And then I realized, that's a coyote, a coyote. And man, they're brave. They're right there on, on Roselle. And, and so anyway, dogs in Scripture, they're not good. I know. You love it. <laughs> I just stepped on everybody's toes, okay? Yes. Uh, verse 3, for, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. Uh, you know, there's so much we can say. You, when we read about uh, Israel in, in Exodus and the taskmasters demanding, you, 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 you will increase your tasks. You will intensify your work. You know what these dogs and evil workers and the members of the concision are seeking to do as taskmasters? They put the thumb screws on the believer. They put the pressure on the believer. They, they demand. They squeeze. They, they, they press and they pressure the believer. 
produce, produce, produce. And I love what Paul says in verse 3. I rejoice where? In Christ Jesus. He is our rest. But anyway, verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, well, I more. Want to have a flesh contest? Paul, in effect, is saying, all right, let's do it. Well, look at me. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching a law, Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So you say, wait a minute. The issue is uh, the, the law. When, when Paul warns, if I destroyed something, I'm a transgressor. If I go back and rebuild it, Paul, he's, he's demonstrating this is who I was. In my Jewish identity. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me. Those I counted loss. For Christ. Yea doubtless I count all things. But loss for the excellency. Of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord the gold. Silver precious stone. The advanced levels of understanding. Regarding the place and purpose of Jesus Christ. And the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. And God says why don't you build that. Into the realm of the inner man. Don't go back to the wood, hay, and stubble. Don't go back to the material that is used for the purpose of oppressing and for the purpose of opposing what God is doing. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss, gone, destroyed, broken down for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He's not saying... It's excellent, the knowledge of Christ Jesus. It is excellent, isn't it? It's talking about the excellent level of, of knowledge regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, to know Jesus in his messianic ministry is a sweet truth. But to know him as revealed through the mystery, it's excellent stuff. It, it, it's, it's, it excels For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the what? Law. He's talking to Philippians who are being being threatened by a bunch of legalistic dogs, a bunch of legalistic religious evil workers, a bunch of religious bigots, called the concision. Oh, you got to live under the precepts of that law program. Remember what Paul, what, what Paul says in Acts chapter 20? <clears throat> Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. <clears throat> Acts 20 verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to, to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. So far as we, we, we look at Exodus, again, there's a motif there. there, there there's this inherent danger that Paul is warning against, and, and we can't lose sight of the building material back there. Now, um, if you go over to, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, back there in uh, chapter 1 of Exodus, as well as chapter 5 of Exodus, we learn of taskmasters, right? Uh, In Exodus, they're called taskmasters. And they're the ones with the oversight. They're the ones with the official authority to supervise and to issue command. And and, and you understand what a taskmaster is doing. There are taskmasters in the religious arena, and Paul identifies them. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you notice there at verse 20, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. Now, suffer means you allow. Well, you know what? Look there at verse 19. For ye suffer fools gladly. Now, you think about the the Israelites in in Exodus in Egypt, hard rigor. Were were they suffering? Now, suffer means allow, but but 
just just kind of get a feel for what Paul is, for ye suffer fools gladly. Now, you're allowing something to happen within your midst. But they're also going to suffer. And, and notice, ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer, that is, you allow, if a man bring you into what? But there's a human figure. By the way, it isn't some Johnny come lately, walks into the assembly and says, John, uh, you need to fill in the blank. You want to be close to God. You want to make God happy. You want to be accepted by God. You want God to bless you. You've heard all of those cliches, right? But see, if anybody walked in and started making those kinds of demands, who are you? But now, who are these guys? Who are these guys that were able to deceive an entire church? See, these are the ones that possess the degrees. These are the ones that possess the theological background. These are the ones that possess the, uh, the scriptural training. Now keep reading. Verse 20. If a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, you know what those taskmasters are doing to the nation of Israel? They're just chewing them up and spitting them out. Uh, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. You know what those taskmasters were doing to these Israelites back in the day? You, 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 they no sympathy. You fall down. You don't carry your burden. They don't, they don't pull you off to the side and comfort you and give you a glass of water. And, you know, maybe you just need a little 15-minute break. <laughs> it's not what taskmasters do. You know what they do? They kick you in the gut. Get up. Whip you a few extra times. Get going. You know what, Paul? If a man smites you on the face... You have been so duped to allow religion to come in and smack you around, get you in the religious shape, get you to conform to the religious system, and you receive it gladly. I'm a member of that so-and-so church. By the authority of Dr. Fill-in-the-blank. Paul, he, verse 21 I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit wherein soever any is bold. I speak foolishly, I'm bold also. Are they, here we go, Hebrews. Paul, the, the evil, the concision. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. You know what these guys are doing? Law. Law, law, law. So now we go over to Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Notice, uh, you know what, let, let's read, before we read verse 6, go to chapter 4, Notice uh, chapter 5. Notice Galatians chapter 5. Again, Paul's going to identify the element. These are, these, are, these are persons, these are people that carry a weight of authority. Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. Whosoever he be. Now, we don't see the word taskmaster, but just uh, appreciate the parallel here. Wait a minute. God's people in, in Exodus, they're under the authority of these taskmasters, smiting them. Well, these Hebrews, these uh, 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 concision, drop down to verse, chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, 
but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. (coughs) So we have this similarity. Paul in Galatians, he says, listen, I'm not going to rebuild the things that I destroyed. What's going on back there in Exodus? They're building something. There are supervisors that are oppressing the Israelites. Well, there are oppressors operating in Galatia. And Paul says, I know what's going on. They're they're, they're taking advantage of you. We read back there, of course, uh, go to Galatians chapter 2. Notice how often in book of Galatians, now, of course, in Exodus, Israel, they're under bondage. Well, that's what's going on with the Galatians. Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into what? Bondage. Chapter 4, verse 3. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 9, but now after that ye have known God, or rather ye are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Verse 24, bondage. Verse 25, bondage. Chapter 5, verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of what? Bondage. bondage. Do you see the Exodus narrative? Now that's only three parallels. Let's keep going. Chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2. Now, remember when we were there in Exodus? We read there in chapter 5, verse 13, that the taskmasters, they intensified the work. Get back to work. Who are you guys to rest? Boy, that's the satanic, the the, the tactic today is he doesn't want us, Satan doesn't want you or, or me to rest in Christ. I mean, rest in Christ? Get going. Get working. You know, grace, I'll tell you, if there's any, grace means we don't have to prove ourselves to God. Isn't that wonderful? You know what religion says? You better prove yourself to God. You better prove your worth. You better prove your worthiness. And, and grace says you don't have to do that anymore. Don't you have to prove anything to God. You know why? Because God already proved himself to us. Amen. We don't have to prove anything to get God. God says, I'm going to prove how much I love you. What did he do? We talked about it yesterday. He commended his love toward us in that while we were in sin. So So what does religion say? No, 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 no. No sleeping on the job. No rest. No peace. You got to toil, you got to grind, you got to dig in, you got to produce, you got to, and, and then, and then you, you might have missed something, so you better get on your knees every night, you better start confessing, you better start getting, you know what I'm saying? Just, just a, a weight of, well, that's in type, the bondage that we can read about there. Uh, we'll just read one verse, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we uh, have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So there's another parallel, the issue of works. Uh, here to me is, is such a, go, uh, this one I want to read again. Go to Exodus chapter 6. Go to Exodus chapter 6 and then go over to Galatians chapter 3. Uh, Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6. And I love, this is when, when through Moses. Exodus chapter 6. And uh, let's read again verse 5. Exodus 6, 5. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Verse 6, Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. You know what Paul says about redemption in Galatians? Go to chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Again, you have this Exodus narrative, this Exodus imagery, this Exodus motif in the book of Galatians. uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath 
redeemed us from the curse of the law. You know what Israel needed from the oppression via the Egyptians? They needed redemption. You know what God says? I'm going to redeem you out of all that. You know what God did for the believer? He's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now go to chapter 4. Notice chapter 4. And look what we read here in verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, there's a lot going on, verses 1 and following. Paul's talking about, you know what it means to be out from under the law? Verse 1, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord over, over all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The appointed time of the father is the dispensation of grace. And, and in light of what Paul... Listen, God does not uh, 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 shirk the responsibility. He doesn't use third-party tutors or governors for the purpose of training a son. The law is, in, is the tutor and the governor. The law was that the elementary things... The elementary principle, the law was a schoolmaster. And that schoolmaster was hired, was used by the, the master to, to educate the child. You know what God is saying in chapter 4? I am not going to use the schoolmaster law. I am not going to use the elementary first principle system of the law program to educate my children in the dispensation of the grace of God. It says there, uh, but is under, verse 2, under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the Father. God's dealing with his people today quite differently. He enjoys direct personal edification. And so you keep reading verse 3, even so we when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under law to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are what? Sons. Go to Exodus chapter 4. And, and here's another parallel. So the, the issue of redemption, Israel needed redemption well, Paul, in Galatians, he describes, we've been redeemed from the law. Not only that, the Father, he deals with us as sons. What did God promise? And what did he say? For example, Exodus chapter 4, and notice there verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my, what? Son. Even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go. What is Paul telling the Galatians? You've been liberated from that inferior system of the law. Under the bondage of the law. Under the schoolmaster, the tutors and the governors of the law. God says, I have appointed you as sons. I redeemed you. I freed you. Let my people go. And what are the Galatians doing? They're going right back to that program. Can you imagine a father going to such lengths to free his child from slavery? And the child says, sort of like the, like the Israelites in the wilderness. You know, we got, our bellies were full when we were slaves. I miss the flesh pots of Egypt. You know, at least we got a meal. Oh, yeah. We got beat to a tar. Yeah, they treated us with rigor. Yeah, they abused us. Yeah, we toiled. And, and, but, you know, at least we were fed. It, it, it defies, obviously, common sense for a child to say, I want to go back. Well, Paul 
he, the language in Galatians. Uh, of course, uh, one more. Now, in, in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 3, go to Exodus chapter 3. And we're going we're gonna to stop. Go to, go to Romans chapter 7. Yes, I know, Romans. Ah, hey, good. Tony, man, he had his marker there in Galatians, and now he's confused. Romans is to the left. <laughs> yes, it is in your Bible. Romans. Where did Romans come from? Uh, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And uh, read verse 7. Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Here we go, verse 8. And I am come down to Deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now, by the way, to bring them out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Boy, don't miss our eternal prospect. Listen, we're blessed with all blessings. And where? In heavenly places. But you see the issue of being delivered I will deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. We'll close here, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And and what does our apostle say? Verse 6. But now we are delivered from what? The law. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love. We pray, Lord, that as we get a, a feel for the wood, hay, and stubble connected with and associated with the building of defiance, the building of oppression, the building of cruel rigor and the works of the flesh. May we, may we learn that you desire to see Christ formed in us. May we be careful uh, not to allow the inferior uh, law, uh, legalistic system, uh, the, the performance-based uh, system that the flesh so craves and desires. May we enjoy our rest, our complete standing. May we enjoy that, uh, that place and position that you've given to us through your Son. And may we just enjoy the, the deliverance, the redemption, the adoption, uh, the liberty that we have uh, free from the law. We just thank you for the time that we can spend. And as always, may it redound to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as then we pray, amen.